Uh, folks, we are continuing with our series this morning as we focus on our theme of the power of decision. And we're going to be looking at a passage in Mark's Gospel, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. And we are going to read about an encounter with Jesus that really introduces a, an area of decision that affects all of our lives. And we're going to be talking about the area of friendship this morning. And so let us read from verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why do you think these things? Which is easiest to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. May God truly bless his word to us this morning. Amen. So let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you again for an opportunity to hear your word. As we are sharing this morning, there are just so many millions of believers around the world who would give anything to be in a place like this, to hear your word taught and shared in a way where they would not be persecuted or in a way where they would not in any way be prejudiced because of hearing your word. And we thank you for the freedom we have to come into a place and just to study your word together, to hear what you would say about our lives, about making decisions and living for you. And we ask this morning again that you would open our hearts to receive this word, that it may only be from you, Lord, and that we may go away being doers of that word for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I truly believe that this area that we're going to be looking at this morning has profound consequences for our lives. And that is the decisions we make around friendships. The people in your life can be your greatest spiritual asset or they can be your greatest spiritual curse. You can gather around you the right people who will lift you up, who will encourage you, equip you, and feed you spiritually. Or you can have those around you who continually drag you down, discourage you, mislead you, and move you further from God. Right now, I'm sure you can think of people in your life whether now or in your past, who are or who were a negative influence. Think of those people in your life who've been toxic people, who have caused heartache, who have actually taken you further from God. And so here in Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, we have one of the great stories about friendship. 
The story is about a paralyzed man. And you can imagine for a moment what life must have been like for this man. Where his entire life was restricted to a mat, probably a half a meter wide by about two meters long. It's all he ever knew. Somebody always had to feed him, carry him, clothe him, move him around so that he wouldn't be covered with bed sores, clean him, and so on. That sense of independence that we prize so much, he would never know. And it's apparent that to this point, nothing could be done for him. No surgery, no rehab programs, no treatment clinics, no hope. There was no way for him to contribute to society. He was in essence a beggar. He would have had to be laid on his mat by the side of the road day after day, dependent on anyone who might stop and put some money into his hat. And maybe some days he found himself dreaming of a day when he would have a healthy body, when he'd be able to walk and run and make things with his hands and Maybe hold his children in his arms, even play with them. And then he'd come to his senses and stare at the ceiling of a room that he could never walk out of. Think about what that would be like for you. Think of the body that held him captive day after day. The mat that was his entire world, knowing that he would never be free of it. No money, no job, no influence, pretty much no future. What's he got going for him? Just one thing. A few very special friends. In fact, amazing friends. It seems this whole story in Mark's Gospel is only here because of his friends. Think about it. Without his friends, he would never have made it to Jesus. Without his friends, he never gets healed. Without his friends, he never hears the word of forgiveness. All of these things flow out of some very wise decisions that he made a long time ago to choose great friends, devoted, loyal, committed, deep, life-giving, life-bringing friends. And so I want to talk about friendship today. And I want to challenge you to evaluate your friendships. To decide how you aim to cultivate, with God's help, life-changing, heart-shaping, character-forming, loyal, lasting friendships. For this paralytic the forging of these friendships would have happened not accidentally. Because of his physical condition, the deck was stacked heavily against any friendship ever emerging from this little group of people. Even in our day, people who wrestle with any physical disability will tell you that their greatest challenge, their greatest heartache is not the disability, but the rejection they they seem to feel from those who are classified as normal. This is a fast-paced world that we live in, a world that is very intolerant of those who can't run fast. And in particular, the ancient world was not an easy place for disabled people. Historians generally believe that the Greeks regularly disposed of newborn children with physical deformities. Aristotle wrote, and I quote, let there be a law that no deformed child should be raised to adulthood, end quote. In first century Rome, there was actually a statute that read, and I quote, quickly kill a deformed child, end quote. In Israel, it wasn't any better. Because in Jewish belief, you were only deformed or sick 
or disease because of your sinfulness. And so if you suffered physically from any kind of ailment, it was the result of your sin and you would be alienated. You would look, be looked down upon. Which is exactly how the people around this paralytic looked upon him. And we know this from the book of Job, where Job was, was righteous before God, and yet everything that happened to him was said to be because of his sinfulness. Even his friends came and said, Job, you've got to repent. It's because of your sin that you are going through what you're going through. Think of the, the man who was born blind, and the disciples came to Jesus and said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, none of them. You see, that was the understanding in Jewish thought. You certainly would not be pitied if you had a deformity. And this is the world he lives in. But he has this little band of men who refuse to let his physical condition, <clears throat> his social stigma, keep them from being his friends. But then you've also got to think through the eyes of the paralytic what he had to go through to have these friends. How guilty you must have always felt of being so dependent upon them. Knowing that every day they had to bear witness to his neediness. How many times must he not have been envious of their health, envious of their independence, their freedom. A freedom he would never know. You see, it's a very vulnerable place to be in when someone has to carry your mat. When someone's carrying your mat, they see you at your worst. They see all your weaknesses, all your faults. And you might even get dropped when someone is carrying your mat. There's this gift between them of, of trusting vulnerability, dependable faithfulness. It's one of the most beautiful pictures in the New Testament of friendship here. Yeah. So let me ask you, who in your life do you allow to carry your mat? Who do you allow to see you at your most vulnerable, at your worst, with all your faults and weaknesses and hang-ups and sinfulness? Who do you bear your soul to that they might pray for you? Who do you allow to see your brokenness, your wretched humanity? Because those are your true friends. And I want to say, friends, if you choose never to be vulnerable, you are making a choice never to have a true friend. Because true friends are only those that you are prepared to be vulnerable with. They may be your companions, acquaintances maybe, colleagues or associates, but they're not your friends. When you have a friend, you let them carry you on the mat sometimes. You let them see your, your weaknesses. You open yourself up to them. If you want a deep friendship, you cannot always be the strong one. You cannot live with deep secrets. You're going to have to let somebody into your life to carry your mat sometime. To be vulnerable. But let me just issue a caution here. Because what makes... A friendship so great is the very thing that makes a friendship so dangerous. You see, when we are with a friend, we tend to drop our guard. 
And the reason we are attracted to certain people is because we are all our acceptance magnets. We are all acceptance magnets. We are repelled by rejection. We are attracted to acceptance. And when I'm with people who accept me, I tend to drop my guard. And I sometimes drop my guard in order to be accepted, to be one of the crowd, to be one of the group. And that is incredibly dangerous. Acceptance leads to influence. And often it can be a very toxic influence. How many times when you were growing up did you do something really bad and you were with someone? How many times did you do really bad things on your own? You see, if you're going to let your guard down, you've got to make sure that you do that with someone you absolutely trust, someone who is a true friend. And these are the friends who are the carriers of the mat. And one day Jesus comes to their town. And these guys hear about this rabbi who's done amazing healings, who's, whose teaching is profound, and they want to go and hear him as we would when we hear there's a great preacher coming into town. And one of them says to the others, we can't just go by ourselves. We've got to somehow get our friend there. This could be a life-changing experience for him. Who knows, the things we've heard about Jesus may even come to pass in his life. Maybe he is healed. Wouldn't that be something? We've got to get his mat there. It's not going to be easy. But you see, they're not thinking of themselves. They're not thinking about the logistics and how difficult it might be. They're thinking of their friends because that is what friends do. Friends serve one another. Friends go the extra mile for one another. And friends want their friends to see Jesus. And so they tell him they'll pick him up at 7 o'clock in the morning. And when they pick him up, they literally pick him up. And they go off to the house where Jesus is preaching. And it's jammed with people. You see, in those days, there weren't too many other distractions like there are today. No television, no gyms, no walks, no runs, no movies, no Xboxes, Playstations, you name it. There were none of those things, and so everybody would be out there to go and hear this great preacher. And Mark goes to some trouble to describe the scene to us. He says there's no room, not only in the house, but even outside the front door. And as they come with their friend on the, on the mat, you can imagine them thinking, so near yet so far. If only we could get him to Jesus. which leads them to do the unthinkable. They do something that is totally unorthodox in order to get into the room. They climb up the stairs on the side of the house onto the roof and they start to dig a hole. Nothing will stand in their way. It was the first home makeover. Imagine the scene. Jesus is teaching inside, and you can just picture the people crammed into this small space, sweating in the Palestinian heat, and suddenly these bits of rubble start dropping down on them. Straw and clay and resin. as these guys start remodeling the guy's house. Can you imagine the owner of the house standing there watching this hole? This unscheduled skylight being installed in his home. 
And the hole gets bigger, and then the hands come through, and then more hands come through, and it gets bigger and bigger until they see faces coming through. And ultimately, a mat comes through, and they lower it, and the people have to squash even more to get the mat in front of Jesus. Can you imagine the commotion, the scorn, the ridicule, the indignation? We've been here for three hours to get the front row seats, and you come through the roof. We get upset even when somebody sits in our chair. And so this man is lowered into the presence of Jesus. Because that's what true friends do. They help their friends come to Jesus. And then Jesus says a remarkable thing. In verse 5. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, whose faith? Not the faith of the man on the mat. Normally you think of healing, you've got to have faith to be healed. But no, in this instance, it's not the faith of the one to be healed. It's the faith of the friends. When he saw their faith, He said to the man on the mat, Son, your sins are forgiven. That is what the faith of a friend can do. It moved these friends to dig a hole through the roof in order to get their friend to Jesus. And so let me ask you, when last did you do something extraordinary for a friend? like digging a hole through a roof. You see, sadly, our society has confused friendship with friendliness. We flew to Canada, and we had an air hostess who looked after us. And she brought food to eat and drinks to drink. And at night, when we were about to sleep, she asked if we needed another blanket or pillow, asked us if we were comfortable. I've never had somebody doting over me for so long by one person. She was devoted to serving me. That was her job. In the sky, she was really my friend. And we got off the plane and we went off to the luggage hall, waited for our luggage, and there was a lot of heavy luggage. And then I spotted her walking toward me with one of the pilots. And imagine if I went to her and said, sorry, can you just come and help me with my luggage and get it onto the trolley and take my trolley off to the taxi or the bus or whatever. She would have told me to get lost. But you were on the plane, you were so friendly to me on the plane, did she lose her friendliness? No, she was not my friend. She was friendly but not my friend. We live in a world of networking, of contacts, of quid pro quos. But when the relationship isn't strategic anymore, when the plane lands, the relationship's over. Yes, maybe he's a colleague of yours. Maybe she's a mutually beneficial acquaintance. but they're not a friend. A friend is not somebody who is useful to you. A friend is not somebody who is strategic when it suits you. True friends dig holes through roofs to get you to Jesus. No matter what anyone says, no matter how embarrassing it might be, no matter what commotion it might cause, they don't care what happens next. No matter what it's going to cost to do the repairs to the roof afterwards, they don't care about that because all they want to do is get you into the presence of Jesus. And here we have a story of friends thinking of their friend. Humanity at its best. 
And the outcome is one that we would have expected. Because this paralytic is not only healed physically, he's healed spiritually. Son, your sins are forgiven. Why does Jesus say, sons, your sins is forgiven? Because of the belief that your deformity is because of your sinfulness. So Jesus straight away says, your sins are forgiven. Be healed. You're clean. You're forgiven. You're right with God. And you can imagine what impact that made on that man. When somebody is your friend, your greatest desire for them, listen now, friends, when someone is truly your friend, your greatest desire for them, deeper than their physical well-being, is that things are right between your friend and God. Is that things are right between your friend and God. Their deepest concern is for the well-being of your soul. And I want to ask you, do you have a friend like that? Are you a friend to someone like that? Do you have friends who are lost without Christ and you couldn't really care how they live? And you say, well, that's the way they want to live. That's okay. It's not okay. Because if you're a true friend, you bring that person to Jesus. You talk about Jesus at every opportunity because that's what true friends do. Do you have friends like that? Let me just come out of the gospel just for a moment. And listen to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, do not be misled. Another translation that says, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. You hear that? Bad company corrupts good character. Now we need to hear this this morning because I really believe that God is speaking to many of us about the company we keep. You see, the deception of Satan is to get us to believe that the opposite is also true. That good company can lift bad character. I'm good and I'm with that person and surely they'll become good too. And Paul says, don't be misled. Because more often than not, the bad company is going to pull you down rather than you pulling them up. Let me tell you, that always happens. I have young people getting engaged in relationships, wanting to get married, and they say, well, I'm a Christian, they're not a Christian, but I'm sure after a time they will become Christians too. You know that in all my ministry, probably 5% of the time have I ever seen that happen. Invariably what happens is that the bad company corrupts the good company, and before long, the so-called Christian is no longer worshipping God. And that is why the scriptures are so clear on not being unequally yoked. Because it says, what can light have in common with darkness? Eventually the darkness will drag you out of the light. Make no mistake. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, or 1, 2 Timothy 2, yes, avoid godless chatter because those in, who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. He says their teaching will spread like gangrene. What an interesting analogy. Avoid godless chatter. Are you in the company of those who, who engage in godless chatter? Because Paul says, those who indulge in it become more and more ungodly. You see, the bad thing about gangrene is that it starts from just a simple, very small infection, and then the, the blood and the life stops flowing to that part of the body until eventually that part of the body dies. It literally dies. And what a graphic picture we have of making a wrong decision around friendship. 
what that can do to an otherwise healthy person. Your greatest regrets, listen now, your greatest regrets in life will not revolve around your enemies, but will revolve around your friends. And if they are not good, godly, healthy friendships, and you've got to be on your guard. We said that Proverbs is probably the one book that God included in Scripture to help us to make decisions. And I'm contemplating moving into a study of Proverbs after this series for that very reason. But listen to what Paul, or rather Solomon says, walk with the wise and become wise. You see, that's the promise. But he has the warning. For a companion of fools suffers harm. Walk with the wise and become wise. But the companion of fools suffers harm. You see, wisdom is contagious. If you surround yourself with people that the Bible considers wise, it's contagious. By your close proximity to them, you yourself will become wise. And when Solomon talks about walking, he's talking about doing life with those people, being in the company of those who are wise. But the warning is that if you're in the fools, you'll become a fool. You'll be influenced by those fools. And maybe there's someone here this morning who's trying to defend a toxic relationship in your life. And you know in your heart of hearts that this is bad news. This is dragging you down. This is not life-giving. And you quietly convince yourself that I'm never going to do what they do. And I'm never going to speak like they speak. And I'm not going to swear like they swear. And I'm not going to tell the jokes they tell. And I'm not going to think the way they think. And therefore I'm okay. I'm safe. You know what Solomon says? You did wrong. You're dead wrong because you're in the companion of a fool. And whether you ever adopt that lifestyle or that mindset or not, you will eventually be harmed by the outcome of the fool's behavior. So what is a fool according to the Bible? The Bible says a fool is a person who knows the difference between right and wrong and just doesn't care. That's a fool. I know the difference between right and wrong, but I don't care. You say to the fool, don't you know where this is leading you? Don't you know what the consequences are of what you're doing? And they'd say, I really don't care. I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. He said, that's a fool. And Solomon says, if you're in the company of that person, guess what? you're going to suffer the same consequences as they will. If you're in a toxic friendship with someone who doesn't care about his or her life, believe me, they're not going to care about your life either. If you're mixing with a group of people who don't care about themselves, they aren't going to care too much about your welfare either. If you have a close friendship with someone who doesn't really care about their marriage and where it's going, they're not going to care about your marriage either. They're not going to come alongside you and say, I think that what you're doing is wrong. Because they don't care about your marriage. Because they don't care about their marriage. And that, friends, is not true friendship. You're in the company of a fool. If you mix with people who are flippant and careless about their money and their finances, they will be as careless and flippant with your money if you give them half a chance. And that means whether you ever think like them or not, whether you behave like them or not, you're in a dangerous place. Because the companion of a fool bears the consequences of the fool 
himself. And so let's bring this to a close. You see, this story is here in Mark's Gospel. Because somewhere along the line, this unlikely band of men decided we are going to be friends with this paralyzed man. And I can imagine this man who's now healed. At the end of his life as an old man, his friends may be coming around to visit him with their canes and their walkers and maybe even in a wheelchair themselves. And because he got new legs that day, he got a lifetime warranty on his legs. And he's probably dancing around the living room while these other guys are parking off there old and decrepit. The tables have turned. And I wonder what he might be thinking if he truly had to reflect on his life. This is what I think he'd be thinking. That outside of the forgiveness that he received that day, and outside of his destiny with Jesus that day, the greatest gift of his life were not his legs, but the greatest gift of his life were his friends. There's no gift like a true friend. The power of decision. Choose your friends well. Because let me tell you, one day when you get to the end of your life, it's not going to matter how big a house you lived in. It's not going to matter how much money you made, or what kind of car you drove, or how high you climbed up the corporate ladder, or how successful your business was. What will make all the difference to you is how many true friends you made. Those who laughed with you, those who sobbed with you, those who grieved with you, mourned with you, those who celebrated with you, danced with you, and most of all, those who brought you just a little bit closer to Jesus. If you're in a relationship or you're in a friendship right now, and those individuals are not bringing you any closer to Jesus, you need to seriously evaluate those friendships. And the only exception is that that person is not in Christ, but you have an earnest desire to reach out to them for Jesus. That's the only exception that you can remain in that kind of relationship. I'm not suggesting we separate ourselves from those who are in the world. I'm talking about true friendship. And true friendship from what we've seen in this passage is wanting your friend to come to know Jesus. To know his healing, to know his forgiveness, and to know the life that he comes to offer us. So who are your friends this morning? I'm not asking who your companions are, who your acquaintances are. I'm asking who are your friends? Who are those who will go the extra mile for you? Who are those who will sacrifice anything for you? Because they are your true friends. Nurture them. Nurture those friendships. Because one day they will be the ones who will be by your bedside when you need them most. I was chatting to my mom last night. She's 89 this year. She has said she, this week, she went through her little diary, her little notebook with all the names of all her friends. 
their telephone numbers and that. She said out of about 50 or so names, there's only one who's still alive. And she's desperately lonely because there's just nobody around to come and see her. And I know we all get to that place one day. But I think now we have an opportunity to build friendships and forge friendships that will last. And sure, if the Lord takes them before you, that's unfortunate. But that is why we need to make as many true friends as possible. And why we need to be true friends to others so we can be there for them when they need us most. Amen? Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we sing that chorus, what a friend we have in Jesus. And there's no truer word than that. Because you did everything that a true friend does. You gave your life for us. You expected nothing in return. While we were still sinners, you demonstrated love toward us. And Lord, you call us to be friends of one another. You call us to go the extra mile. You call us to sacrifice. You call us to serve. You call us to bring our friends to Jesus. Lord, I pray that today you will enable us to evaluate our friendships. To discern between those that are toxic that are taking away from our soul and those that are healthy and godly that are feeding our soul. Lord, may we make the right decisions when it comes to choosing our friends because, Lord, they can have lasting consequences in our lives. I pray that your word would just continue again to speak into our lives through this week and beyond. That we would even be reminded of those things you spoke to us about last week. About just saying the word and obeying your word. Lord, help us to make godly decisions in the relationships we form. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.